Welcome to the launch of Inclusion London's report, Lockdown and Abandoned. Before we start, we have BSL interpreters and captions on this webinar if you need them. It's really great to have you all here to mark the launch of our second report, gathering evidence about the impact of COVID-19 on disabled people throughout the pandemic. The report explores the issues that disabled people across the UK told us about following the first lockdown through our lockdown lifting survey, which received hundreds of responses. It also explores the issues identified in the second and third mm -hmm. lockdowns through focus groups, our quarterly Inclusion London campaigns forums, interviews and interactions with our member DDPOs and individual disabled people. We identified five areas where disabled people were being impacted, which were with mental distress, employment and financial difficulties, social care, access to healthcare, medicine and vaccines, access to the community. And we also included the experience of shielders in an earlier report that launched last month, which have continued to remain relevant in this report. We have a number of amazing speakers here today to talk about the various themes explored in our report, discussing the problems they faced and the solutions they suggest going forward. Many of our speakers also directly contributed their experiences to the report. Our speakers will be talking about the problems they faced in specific key themes we identified and the solutions needed going forward. If anyone has any questions, please put them in the question and answer section of the webinar and we will put them to the speakers at the end. We are also live streaming to Facebook, so if you're watching there, hello, and please put your comments um, questions in the comments box and we will put them to the speakers at the end too. So. I will now go on to introduce our speakers. I believe we have our speaker for the financial difficulties and employment section, which is Piers Wilkinson. Piers Wilkinson was recently a disabled student and is now a freelance consultant during the pandemic. Piers, over to you to talk about the problems and the solutions for uh, the pandemic. Uh, hi everyone, um, I think I've unmuted myself now, all good. Um, thanks for, for, first of all, thanks for having me, but also just the amazing work that's gone into this. Um, and it really does reflect the experiences that I've had, which I'll share in a second. Um, it, the What the report calls for is, is very much what um, definitely will address some of the, the issues that I face personally, but I think many disabled people listening and watching this at a later date will not, will also feel resonates with their experiences as well. Um, at the start of the pandemic, I was a disabled student. I worked in, um, uh, I had a, a, a contractual job with, with an organization uh, that unfortunately came to a close in, in sort of June, July um, of 2020. Um, even even with the fellow scheme, even with all of the sort of aspects of so-called support that was put out there, the bureaucratic systems that were put in place uh, to supposedly support um, myself as a disabled person who was shielding um, during the pandemic, none of them were realistically available or uh, for myself as someone that struggles with uh, digital accessibility uh, issues, uh, as well as um, accruing a lot of financial debt trying to afford uh, rent in particular, uh, but all the additional costs that came with being a shielder um, during those first couple of months and um, the, the remaining eight to nine, 10, 11 months that we've still been shielding. Um, as it stands right now, um, uh, almost a year since we all started shielding, those of us that did, uh, I, I, I sit at um, two and a half thousand pounds in debt as a result of um, trying to not become homeless during the pandemic as a result of 
uh, incredibly high costs of living, uh, increases to my costs of living, the inadequacy of um, support packages, particularly for children like myself, but also the additional costs that came as a result of um, the so-called support packages that were put in place were just uh, wholly inept for, for myself, but also I think for quite a few people. And that was uh, highlighted in, by by numerous people, at least definitely in the the, the shielding round table that I was a I was personally a part of, and the the wider report. The the way in which in, in employment, in particular, post uh, post my my role finishing um, that I had had previously, um, I didn't want to become a freelance consultant. I didn't want to have to uh, try and uh, find clients and find people to pay me to do work uh, I, because it's a stressful position to be trying to manage your health care your your food your your housing situation um the pandemic situation shielding um trying to protect yourself whilst also trying to navigate uh job applications and, and all that sort of thing with the dramatic shift to, to online that that occurred as a result of the pandemic and as a, being being a shielder there was very significant barriers that I'd faced trying to even just access job applications, access governmental support schemes, as they're all online now and they still aren't all fully digitally accessible. Um, I use assistive technology um, to be able to access predominantly most of the stuff on my computer, but in particular PDF forms uh, and, and those sorts of um, uh, documentation that are necessary to apply for jobs, to apply for support. Um, and even even when I did get the the meager support that is available for disabled people, um, it, it wasn't enough to pay for my rent. Hence, why I'm two and a half thousand pounds in debt. Uh, I'm sure that's a familiar situation for quite a few people. That even when you're someone like me, who's a a policy sort of nerd that can sort of navigate all of the bureaucratic systems, not all of us are in that sort of position. And I know it's a position of privilege that I have even when I have access to all of the systems that were supposed to be there to support me, it wasn't enough to cover the rent that I was, uh, of the accommodation that I was in. It wasn't enough to cover the additional uh, food delivery costs, the, the surcharges that were occurring, um, uh, the medication charges, the postal charges of having to acquire everything via uh, postal delivery, as well as additional support uh, due to the fact that I couldn't go out uh, and do what I would usually do independently myself. I was fully reliant on charity. I was fully reliant on, on goodwill from friends that were risking uh, themselves in, in the pandemic. And it is fundamentally one of the best things about this report is it reasserts that, you know, I, we don't want charity. I don't want charity. What I want are my rights. I want to be in a financially stable situation. I need a financial support package to both cover the debt that I've accrued and also allow me to get out of where I'm living now, which is an inaccessible dining room um, in a relative's place. And it fundamentally, this this report and the, the employment challenges and the financial challenges are all interlinked. Um, and the report highlights that quite well of how it's just one domino effect after another, all accruing uh, impact after impact, barrier after a barrier, where we're a second thought, we're, well, you're shielding, you'll be fine. It, it's not going to be an issue. You know, you can just order food. And was like, well, you can just uh, get access to job seekers. You can get access to disability related uh, support packages. But even with all of that, it's still not enough to be financially independent, to be financially stable. And with uh, the solutions to going forward are quite simple, which is give us disabled people, give people like myself in my situation, and there's there's many more people in worse situations, um, the financial support that the government gave businesses. You know, as a shielder, I've been protecting both myself and society by not spreading the, the COVID virus or uh, going out and breaking any rules, uh, not just protecting myself, but protecting society and my other disabled friends and colleagues. And yet there's, there's been a, a, a political shift um, towards supporting businesses, towards supporting lo local, um, local initiatives that were supposed to support us rather than giving us the money directly to be able to be independent uh, for ourselves. 
Uh, and as a result of that, the support was put in place by people that weren't experts, that weren't uh, knowledgeable to a certain extent on the issues that we face as disabled people that were shielding, that are clinically vulnerable, uh, even though I hate that word. Um, so we still accrued debt and the support that we were getting was it was inadequate. Um, I've only got a, a couple of minutes left, um, a minute or so. Um, so I really, really want to sort of focus on the employment aspect, which is even in a world where everything was online, where I can work from home, where I was as a digital and um, policy um, sort of, that's my background, was best suited to support businesses, to support, you know, new jobs that were cropping up in, 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 in responding to the pandemic. I, as a disabled person, was still unable to get um, work in a field where it should be quite readily available given everyone is now online working, given everyone's distance working. And I think that is a tantamount issue that needs to be addressed both during this pandemic as it continues, but post pandemic is that all of these digital solutions that were hastily put in place, all of these um, uh, financial packages that were given to, to you know, private businesses and companies um, are made available to us that are shielding and to disabled people generally. And there is a reform of how policies are done in future so that it doesn't happen again, but also so that we can don't continue to face the barriers that we faced before the pandemic. The, you know, the, the, the reduction in, in, in financial support via the social security system was never enough before the pandemic. This has just highlighted it. And the discrimination that we face as disabled people in accessing the job market, even though we're fully qualified for these jobs, if anything, we, uh, better suited, particularly given we know how to shield, we know how to work online, we've been doing it for years. Uh, and that's one of the things that I, I really do enjoy about this report is it's got our lived experiences in, it's got the solutions that, you know, we've sort of talked about for a couple of years now, if not decades. I know there are some people um, that were speaking after me that have got decades of experience in in calling for these things. So it's not anything new. We just want to be listened to, to be given the independence that we deserve and to be given our rights and not a charitable case of giving funding to a charity to then give funding to us or support to us. And I think I'll finish on that note. Thank you, Piers, uh, for sharing your experience. Um, that was really insightful and um, really important to share. Our next speaker that I will move on to is Ozzy Stewart, who will be talking for five minutes about the problems and solutions with respect to shielding and the intersectional impact during the pandemic. Ozzy, over to you. Uh, good, good evening, and again, thank you for inviting me to this event to speak. Um, I would just want to first want to say how much I endorse everything Piers has to say about the experience people have had generally around with um, the kind of COVID-19 pandemic. What it has shown us is how fragile uh, our society is and how, how um, conditional the support that we've been, uh, we've been assumed, uh, we had assumed was a right, but it was but obviously it, it quite turned into a, a conditional uh, a support that could be taken away at a, as a, at a uh, click of a finger, so to speak. One thing in the pandemic for me has been has taught me is that um, we've not won the argument. The argument has always been about rights, cushion control, as Piers rightly pointed out, and and also um, in, empowerment and, and inclusion of disabled people in our society, and wider society. Um, pandemic shown us very much that that has been uh, well, that has never been the case, and in fact. The um, conditional support we had has, uh, has been well, was marginal, uh, grudging, and it can be taken away just, just a click of a finger. I'm talking about shielding today and also intersectionality. And the reason why those two things are very important is because you'll know that people from minority communities have been specifically impacted about, on, on by the pandemic across the board. But specifically, and where intersectionality is important in this, is that we don't look at people as just uh, one dynamic, one individual. You are who you are, but you will be impacted upon the structure of our society discri discriminate on not number of levels. And from a minority community's perspective, that can be quite profound and it can be quite um, 
uh, basically a matter of life and death. As we can see, we, we all know the data around the fact that if you're from a minority community, you're more likely to die from the pandemic. If you're below learning disabilities, uh, you're six times more likely. But if you dig down in those, num in those numbers, even within the people learning disabilities, uh, people from minority communities are four times more likely than somebody who's, who is not uh, from a minority community who's learning disabilities to die as well. So there are issues around issues that really speak to that intersectionality. The fact we live certain types of lives and we are, we're impacted our disabilities, etc., are aspect are aspects of our lives which then drive other parts of our lives too. Shielding. When the pandemic started way back last March. Social care disappeared for me, for me, and for many people I know in Camden. I'm a, I live in Camden, centre of the universe, of course. Camden social services disappeared. We didn't know what to do. Uh, we couldn't contact anybody. What, what happens if our PAs disappeared? Who would help us? There was no reply. We were left on our own. It was like a dystopian movie. Um, where where you go through a, an abandoned world of being devastated and you see all these dead bodies of people who died in this horrible situation. Well, I must admit, I was probably one, would have been one of those dead bodies because I felt that abandoned. It was quite frightening. I've never been actually, I've always taken social care services for granted in the sense that although we argue about it, or we, we say it's not enough, although it's humiliating, debilitating, although it's conditional, we always thought it would be there. I never thought it would disappear. And its impact has been quite profound when it has on a lot of people. So I talk about uh, just getting access to food, access to information, uh, access to just communicating, making sure your PAs, if you had them, support services stayed around you, your family could stay around you. Suddenly all these things became conditional, became, became marginal. You didn't know it would actually happen. From my point of view, um, I was, I'm incredibly, and I use the word grateful in its right word here, to my PAs who made it their point. Because to be honest, choice and control only can only work if you've got the right support to do so. And my PAs understood that I was, I'm an equal human being like anyone else. So they were not going to abandon me from that point of view. But that's not been the case for everyone. And um, one thing we need to talk about when we talk about the COVID, the COVID pandemic and its experience, and our experience of it, it was, um, different for different people. In a lot of ways, it was a postcode lottery, depending on lo which local authority you lived in. Some local authorities stepped up, like in the Tower Hamlets. Camden did a pretty good job, relatively terms, but other local authorities were just as autocratic and dictatorial about, for example, direct payments and how they, should, how they should be used, about flexibility, about um, using your funding differently, access to PPE, all these things depended how you what experience you had depended upon your postcode access to uh information in terms of getting support you need and peers mentioned the voluntary conditional support which frankly who wants to depend on goodwill but actually it was crucial for some people but even that was conditional and it was a surprise for you when um some local authorities got their act together and began to say to the people your volunteers, can, we have to we'll put volunteers and we'll put people in to support you. Um, but we're worried about the fraud around these things, about how you use your benefits, etc. Well, where are we? One year down the line, Brent Council, for example, has had not one report of somebody misusing their direct payment over this period of time. No surprise there. Although we're monitored to death as if we are basically criminals in terms of how we use our direct payments. So there, is a, there are lessons to be learned from this about who, who to be trusted, who to be listened to. It should be service users, people like ourselves, I use the word service users, but I say to sell people ourselves, who are the experts. We need resources and we will have to spend them correctly. If we're not provided with them, we won't be able to do so. And it's ironic that, as Piers rightly pointed out, that these systems are put in place not with our will or bidding, but in, on our behalf, because uh, if, for example, voluntary sector organizations stepping in, etc., given funding to do that, it would have been more helpful, as Piers pointed out, if the funding could have come directly to us, to, for us to decide how we would spend it, because frankly, we would be the best people to do so. But talking about intersectionality a bit more, why is it that why is it that some people in our communities, disabled communities, from minority communities particularly, 
were particularly impacted upon by the, by the, by by COVID nineteen, and we know that people have caused um, again caught the virus and also died from it. The people I know in camp who've died from the, the virus, the few disabled people I know who've done so, have all been from minority communities with learning disabilities. That tells us something about how people are looked at, are supported, given resources, given information, and actually valued or not, in the case may be. And it, it disturbed me that maybe that some people in our community are valued less than others. And they are, and that in itself is a, is a concern in that way. So there are lessons to be learned from this. Piers pointed out a few of them, but I would be more, so we say, less ambitious because the, the experience of this has been traumatic. One of the lessons learned is that we are not, our services that we receive are conditional. We have a long way to go to get to, to get to the rights-based choice and control that we are seeking. So there is a there is a real there's a real concern about making sure that whatever comes out of this experience, the learning we should take is to get is that we need to do more to fight for the things we we that should be a, a matter of right and a matter of a matter of course for us. You know, good social care good access to resources to do so. And as Piers pointed out, good access to the job market and the status that, the, the self-respect and status that comes with that. It's, it's, no, it's no, no, in, no surprise that when social care is mentioned, it usually is mentioned in terms of uh, older people in care homes. Not that that's not important, of course it is. But social care is much more than that. It's a whole ecosystem that provides the opportunity for people to work and live as equals in our society. To be able to, to be able to be an equal in our society, we need to have, we need to be valued and have value, a sense of value in ourselves. The fact that social care was removed so quickly tells you something about the lack of value people have for disabled people. For me, that's one of the biggest lessons learned, lessons to be learned. The report is a good beacon to say, this won't happen again. This should never happen again. Whatever happens in the future, this what we've gone through in the last year, and what we will go through in the next six to eight months, has to be a big, a extreme lesson for us in terms of, terms of the way we go in the future. We got the we got the vaccine, and there's conditional issues around the vaccine as well. It just all points to a point where you feel that the sale people are always second. So. I'll just simply say the report is very important, it's, but it's only the beginning of, I would say, the beginning. There's a lot more work to be done to, to embed us as proper citizens in the societies that we have a right to be citizens in. That's me done. Thank you, Ozzy. That was really insightful, um, talking about the shielding and the intersectional impact of the pandemic, as well as the failings around social care. Um, and that is another section within our report um, and leads me nicely on to our next speaker, um, which is Colin Carpenter, who will be talking for five minutes, please, on the problems that you faced during the pandemic and some solutions that you can see going forward. Uh, specifically with respect to social care. Over to you, Colin. Hi, sorry about that. Um, yeah, uh, my biggest problem really is uh, I'm sort of co-parent with my ex and we have joint custody of our daughter. So I have my daughter one week and she has her the next week. And biggest problem I found is trying to fit in shielding with severe lung restrictions to having a daughter. So from the start, when this pandemic all started, I've, uh, my daughter's not stayed with me for a year. Um, she's only been, the only time she was really able to stay was for the summer holidays when the first lockdown ended. And, you know, my, my there was a, we managed to do a two week worth of shielding because my daughter wasn't at school. It is mentally and psychologically for me and my daughter has been incredibly difficult. Um, it's also been difficult for my my ex because she's been having to work while while my daughter's not at school um but where she lives now there's someone who has a public role and has to 
be out in the public being with people so my daughter's there couldn't come with me couldn't stay with me uh it's just been a bit of a nightmare and this this second time as a well i'm sort of taking i wouldn't say taking more risk i'm using more ppe and with instead of just seeing my daughter here and there for a couple hours every day I, i've been having my daughter come and stay with me from say one o'clock until like six o'clock at night and which has been really nice and been providing a bit of a respite from for my ex so she can get on with work and stuff like that but it's been incredibly challenging um not being able to be with my daughter and the distance and you know it, you know if it was a normal if we were in a normal household we by we could both decide that you know we didn't have to send our daughter to school when she was good but we both agreed that it was more beneficial for my daughter to go to school even though knowing that the viral load of a child you know, child's aren't going to get ill but there's still going to be a big issue of them passing the virus on to someone else like myself um was a big thing so we knew we both knew it was more important for my daughter to go to school and i just i lost out and so what we're doing now is i'm seeing my daughter outside most of the time for little things getting cold and all that stuff um uh but it that's incredibly emotional um the, the other thing i found out found about the lockdown is like yeah we know the nhs is under incredible stress and they are still trying to provide the care that we as individuals need in times of emergency but um in april of this year i fell out of my chair and uh hurt my back and uh the nhs was fantastic as always they managed to get me an mri scan and the scan was done and it, it was referred to uh several consultants but the consultants that i needed to see over it um that the, they were either on the front lines or they were in hospital and it took seven months for me to get a proper consultation with a consultant um and basically for seven months i was living under fear but uh, I had, well, I knew I had a spinal syrinx on my neck and I knew the consequences and was told of the signs to look out for, like for a spinal stroke, i.e. being paralyzed from the neck down and not being able to breathe if it was the rupture. Uh, but no one could tell me any more than that until I saw the consultant. For seven months, I had this fear and anguish that my life could be not, ex not necessarily extinguished because of COVID, but be extinguished because uh you know i could have a, i could have had a spinal stroke from the neck down and every, every day was every time i uh, not seeing my daughter was incredibly anxious and i was getting more frustrated and in a way the only thing that really harmed my mind was that i actually knew more about the how to mitigate and take care of myself in relation to the, the virus than most other people would because of my previous work experience so i was i found myself more or less advising or helping people with the correct type of ppe finding that uh, those people in power or those people that were providing ppe to the let's say ourselves our, us as clients what well, it was inadequate there were people who couldn't do it with, couldn't do it because of they couldn't wear masks because of asthma and other breathing issues and I found myself with the knowledge that I had from my previous work experience as being able to advise people and that helped me by helping others but I uh not that the whole point of not being able to see your daughter or have limited access and the fear that your life could be extinguished not because of a virus that everyone else was uh fearing but because you were waiting for a proper diagnosis and you were just told to watch out for the symptoms of a spinal stroke and to have that in your head for seven months was terrifying um and yeah i just found that really hard and i found that talking to groups and other people have really helped me but this i think the system itself didn't couldn't help itself it's i think the virus was just too big and the system be it the direct payments be it social services be it the nhs um weren't ready that's all i can really say it's just been a really yeah it's been a scary at times certainly six, scary seven months for myself that's all i'm really going to say thank you i don't know a way forward 
Hi Colin, um, could you take your camera off for a second? Thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing um, what sounds like a really difficult and harrowing experience that you've had. Um, and that's that's very much the recurring um, voices and, and, and experiences that we've seen uh, through our research and especially with regard to social care. So I'll, I'll move on to our next speaker now, um, who is Katie Panic, who is the campaigns lead at Transport for All, which is a disabled people's organization campaigning for accessible transport systems and inclusive street design. Katie will be talking about the issues that have been faced in the community and with streetscape changes um, with regards to the solutions and the problems uh, going forward. Thanks, Shamima, and um, thank you again to Inclusion London for producing this incredibly important report. Um, such a huge amount of work has gone into this, um, and I think it's just really commendable. <laughs> it's a real, real achievement and something, especially you know, for a DPO um, under the extreme circumstances that we're all facing at the moment. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for that. Um, uh, so yes, I'm going to talk a bit about the issues that disabled people have faced in accessing the community. Um, in terms of transport, specifically, I think about the changes that we've seen to the street space. Um, I am, um, as Shamima said, the campaign's lead at Transport for All. I'm also a wheelchair user myself, and um, I have been shielding as well. Um, there have been just a, a multitude of, of problems um, accessing transport and street space, which is difficult because we were already facing so many problems. Um, it really fe felt like, you know, a year or so ago, we were, you know, we were kind of making progress. We were kind of going in the right direction. Um, and so on a personal level, it has just been quite overwhelmingly um, difficult to see a lot of progress really rolled back um, and quite scary as well with to see the ease with which we've kind of lost so many of those rights that have been so hard fought for. Um, in about May, uh, so in terms of the general issues accessing community via public transport, um, yeah, we've seen a, a lot of rollbacks. Um, the turn up and go um, service uh, that is provided by both TFL and National Rail Services was sort of suspended, modified. Um, the, the idea was that instead of having kind of hands-on assistance, um, so if you're a vision impaired, you know, having sight guiding from the frontline staff, or if you're a wheelchair user, you know, having kind of that physical hands-on um, support to go up the ramp onto the train, that was kind of all suspended, obviously, because of social distancing. Um, uh, transport uh, providers were meant to kind of provide a taxi um, in place of that. We found so many examples of that not happening. Uh, there were issues with taxis and private hire vehicles, again, with social distancing, um, you know, uh, disabled people not being able to sit in the front seat, having to sit in the back seat um, and, you know, not being able to do so, especially if you have mobility issues there. Face coverings has been a huge a huge topic and a, a, a concern that really hasn't haven't really got to the bottom of it um this I you know obviously face coverings are mandatory on public transport for but for those um stable people who can't wear face coverings um the messaging has been unclear meddled it has given rise to a great deal of peer policing on public transport um, and we've seen instances of hate crime and harassment, uh, which is just so deeply upsetting to see. Um, and then, of course, for those of us who have been shielding, um, there's a real kind of reluctance to use any public transport at the moment anyway, full stop, um, be because of the, the risk um, in terms of infection. And we've had lots of stories from our members who have had real problems um, struggling to access you know, the, the, the real things that you can't give up. So hospital appointments, um, other, you know, physiotherapies, um, treatments that you need to get to. Um, and for those people who, you know, don't drive, uh, rely on public transport, um, not having access to patient transport or community transport, um, public transport has been 
terrifying, a terrifying ordeal if you are in that high risk category. Um, you, we've had stories from members who have had their you know, personal space very much intruded upon by, by uh, the members of the public who may or may not be wearing face coverings. So it's been difficult. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit more about changes to street space because uh, that's an area of work that we've been looking at really closely. Um, it was about May uh, or June, I think, last year that we started to get a real influx of inquiries, uh, questions, concerns, comments from our members, but also other disabled people, other people in the wider community with concerns about new, new street space initiatives. Um, so the response to the COVID-19 pandemic saw a, a real sudden and dramatic change to our street space. Some of this was to aid social, social distancing. So, for example, the widened pavements. Um, other schemes were there to promote greener uh, forms of travel. So active travel, walking, wheeling, cycling. Um, so we saw traffic calming measures. So traffic filters, um, more cycle lanes put in um, and low traffic neighborhoods. And um, we heard a lot of concerns about these schemes going in um, due to the kind of very immediate and urgent way in which they were put in. And of course, you know, we understand the reasons for this. Um, new kind of powers were granted to local authorities, which meant that these schemes went in under an experimental traffic order, which meant that the usual consultation and engagement processes that we would usually expect to see just weren't being done at all. Um, equality and impact assessments were patchy <laughs> in the instances where they had been done. They were being written by an individual who did not have the, the necessary level of expertise in accessibility and, and disabled people as, as you would need to to write those um, equality and impact assessments. Um, but the, the sort of the biggest problem here was that disabled people weren't being asked for their opinion, weren't being listened to. And there was a real concern, especially in this time frame when many disabled people, many whom were shielding and not kind of visibly and physically out in street space, out in the world, um, there was a real fear that our concerns were just and our, and our needs were just being completely ignored by policy make makers. Um, so we decided to look into this. Um, we did a sort of big interview project. Um, and we interviewed disabled people across London in all of the areas where new low traffic neighbourhoods had gone in to find out what the concerns were, what the impact of these schemes had been and, and, and what they'd like to see happen. Um, and we found a real range of opinion. Um, and that's really important to say, because obviously we understand that a lot of these schemes for some disabled people have been really positive. Um, and for other disabled people, they've brought very negative impacts, but there is that range of opinion. Um, so kind of on top of that, it's been really disappointing to see the way in which disabled people and our needs have been politicized and oftentimes used as a bit of a political point scorer by people on basically both sides of the debate without this key element of actually, you know, asking us of, you know, what we think. Um, so in terms of the, the positive impacts of these schemes, again, I'm talking about low traffic neighbourhoods, cycle lanes, traffic calming measures, anything that encourages walking, wheeling and cycling. Um, for those living inside of low traffic neighbourhoods, um, many disabled people observed a decrease in traffic and that brought with it the associated benefits of there being less noise. Uh, this was particularly welcomed by, for example, neurodivergent folk who um, found walking around their local area more pleasant, easier. Um, disabled people reported to us that they felt safer um, for example, crossing the roads or um, riding their bike. Um, and this was really good to see, really positive. Um, and for many disabled people, um, particularly those who are hand cyclists or, or cyclists of any, any sort of cycle, um, these schemes encouraged them to, and, and enabled them to actually get out on their, on their cycle more um, and be able to 
to use that kind of active travel and um, disabled people reported kind of benefits to their health, both physical and mental health. So those were all great things and really good to see um, and, you know, are the intended benefits of the low traffic neighbourhoods. Um, however, these benefits could not be enjoyed by everyone. And this is where the problem lies. So we heard a whole range of negative impacts on disabled people. And these were very um, upsetting to hear. Um, so many people observed actually an increase in traffic, particularly if they were on the kind of borderline, the, the boundary edges of a low traffic neighborhood. Um, but even for people inside, um, because low traffic neighborhoods are obviously meant to inconvenience car journeys, for those who rely on car journeys as perhaps the only uh, option that is accessible to them, they saw a real increase in their journey time. Um, an increase in journey time, disabled people told us, led to uh, disabled people feeling more exhausted. Uh, we heard reports of worsening of impairments, uh, particularly if you're you know, sat down uh, for a long period of time uh, or um, other, other elements of that. Um, longer journey times obviously bring with it an increase in money being spent on those journeys. So not just in taxi fares, but also um, petrol. I heard from um, a disabled person living in a low traffic neighborhood who is on universal credit and who was saying, you know, you know I, I simply cannot afford this. You know, it gets trivialized as being only a few minutes extra onto your journey, but that's a few extra minutes that translates into extra petrol money that I simply do not have. So I'm having to make decisions now about which trips are the absolute bare necessities. And that's just not acceptable. Um, it wasn't just an increase in journey time for the disabled residents in these areas, but it was also an in increase in journey time for any visitors to those residents. Um, and this had a real knock on impact in receiving care. So for carers, uh, PAs um, and even family and friends, um, who were traveling to the disabled person to assist them. Um, being stuck in traffic obviously meant that these appointments were late um, or had a knock-on effect if a carer was making multiple trips to see multiple people in an area. Um, we heard a story from a disabled resident who said that some days she just didn't receive care that day. The PA just simply could not get to her. Um, and this, obviously, as we've heard um, from my previous speakers, combined with the impact that COVID-19 is already and was already having on um, care and receiving support, it all just snowballed essentially together. Um, all of these negative impacts, of course, are um, unacceptable in and of them their own, but they are being compounded and made significantly worse by the fact that disabled people simply do not have the equality in accessing other options. So we talk about the idea of carrot and stick, right? You know, if you're putting in a low traffic neighborhood to encourage active travel, it's meant to be there as a carrot to encourage you to, to active travel. But for many disabled people, it's not that, it's just a stick because however much disabled people may want to use public transport or get on their bike, um, sometimes those options are simply not available because of the existing barriers that exist to public transport and to active travel. Um, there's the financial barrier. Um, hand cycles are not cheap. So, you know, while you may be able to go on Gumtree and buy a 50 quid bike and start cycling the next day, for disabled people who want to pick up hand cycling, it's in the thousands and thousands of pounds, um, which is combat compounded again by the lack of cycle hire schemes for adapted hand cycles. Um, there's attitudinal reasons. Um, many disabled people are not aware of um, the fact that hand cycling may be available to them. And this is again, made worse by um, the lack of representation and visibility of disabled hand cyclists. The societal reasons um, for disabled people who are able to um, walk a bit, uh, but uh, use mobility aids to do so. Uh, there's the real and very prevalent stigma that still exists in society. And for some disabled people, um, they do not wish to use their mobility aids in public for fear of harassment and um, 
you know, experiencing that stigma. Um, there's the infrastructure barriers, uh, which I, I'm sure you will all be incredibly familiar with, but the um, pavements are simply not accessible. The lack of dropped curbs, the uneven pavements, the street clutter, which has been exacerbated by uh, extra signs um, talking about social distancing, uh, chairs and tables being put outside businesses to aid social distancing. Um, all of these things, uh, and also the legalization of e-scooters and e-bikes means that there is just so much going on on the pavement now that um, even if the pavement were completely flat, it's it's just a complete obstacle course to navigate it. Um, and obviously, the tube is not accessible. There are issues with buses. There are issues with taxis. There is simply not an equality of, of options available to disabled people. Um, this isn't new information to any of you. Um, this is all very much stuff that we know about. Um, and to pick up something that both Pierre's and Ozzy talked about, um, it's this idea of disabled people being experts in our own experience and in our own needs. And it's something that is just consistently forgotten and overlooked by policymakers, by local authorities, by transport providers, by the people who are making these decisions and making these changes to our street space. And what we saw was a real, just <laughs> smorgasbord of missed opportunities to engage with disabled residents, to consult properly, to write equality and impact assessments that identified the impacts and took steps to mitigate them. Um, three in four of the participants that we spoke to expressed real anger and frustration at the way in which these schemes had been consulted about and um, communicated to them. And it's, uh, it, it is just a real, I mean, it's a real shame. It's a real uh, missed opportunity because, you know, it had these schemes been um, properly consulted and developed kind of and co-produced with disabled people, perhaps they would have been implemented in such a way that didn't directly negatively impact disabled people and actually maybe reduce some of the barriers. Um, but unfortunately, that is just not what happened. So, you know, thinking ahead, what, you know, where do we go from here, talking about solutions um, and the learnings from this, I think, um, and this is something that was very much backed up by the High Court judgment, if you saw that, which was um, uh, the High Court finding that TFL and the mayor had had, had failed to consult disabled residents um, on its Street Space for London scheme. The learning from this is that we are the experts. Um, it, an equality and impact assessment cannot be done by, from a desk by a person who does not know the, the lived experience of disabled people. Um, it just cannot be done. So we need to see a more meaningful um, engagement with disabled people. We need to see schemes that are being co-produced and we need to see um, disabled people treated as the experts that we are. It all comes back again, as always, to nothing about us without us. And I'll hand back over to you.